Hi, Pastor Matt Morton here, lead pastor at Cross Fellowship Church. Uh, before the message begins, I just want to take a moment and say thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, it is our hope and our prayer that by watching this video we uh, and hearing the message that indeed it can help you take one step closer to Jesus today. At the end of the sermon today, you'll hear me offer an invitation to the audience. And the invitation is simply to put your trust and your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're listening today or watching online and you have never done that, uh, can I just encourage you to take that step, take the step to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now maybe you have some questions or you just need to know more about that or even how to do that. At the bottom of the screen, here is a telephone number. That's the church office. Uh, please give that number a call. And if it's during office hours, the, the staff will direct you towards a pastor to help walk you through uh, how do you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. And if it's out of office hours, please leave a message and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching today and blessing. I appreciate Adam. And yes, I did think that at one point when I was baptizing him, I might hold him under just a little bit longer. Um, Sarah, good to see you. Sarah is... The last church I pastored, they called me the weeping prophet, so sorry. Um, Sarah is my daughter's best friend, um, still pretty much to this day. They went on a trip just a while ago. And they didn't get any, in any trouble. I appreciate that, okay? So it's great. Um, every February, it rolls around, and I begin to think I have to get my annual doctor visits in. Now, some of you are not old enough to have to do that, but I am at that point where I have to get my annual doctor visits in. And so the first thing I do is I go to the dentist. I have an appointment every Every year in February, I go to the dentist, they do their thing, they, they watch over me, they make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, or at least coming close to doing what I'm supposed to do. And at one point in my life, you went to the dentist one time a year. And then you got dental insurance, and the dental insurance said, well, you needed to go two times a year. Well, the last time I went this February, I got some new dental insurance when I retired, and my new dental insurance says you've got to go three times a year. And I don't like that, folks. I really don't like that. But they say I need to go. They say that this is something that I need to do. So I went to the dentist and I did my thing and got done. Second thing I did, I did my annual physical just recently, back in February and March. And I went to the doctor. And, of course, before you go to the doctor, you have to go to have drawn, blood drawn. And I did that went to the, my doctor, my family doctor, and she checked everything out and said, Doug, I think you're, you're doing well for the age that you are. And I still don't know how to take that, okay? The age that I am, I'm doing well, but if you were 40, you'd be doing awful. Is that what she meant? I don't know, okay? So in the process of that, I, I got my physical done with my family doctor, I then went to my heart doctor, my cardiologist, and you must think I'm really sick, but I'm really not. I had an atrial fibrillation many years ago, and so in the process of that, they want to see me every year. And I go to them, and they throw me down on their table, and they hook me up, and they do an EKG, and about every fourth year, they do what is called a stress test, and that is to put you on a, uh, a machine, you run, you run, you run, you run. Pretty soon, in the process of that, you, they get your heart beating the amount of times they want it to be per second, et cetera, et cetera, whatever. And then they put you down on this table, and they bring the picture out there, the camera, and they want to take a picture of your heart. And of course, they say at that point, after you are about ready to die, don't breathe. I love my family. I, I love my physicals, okay? I love to go to the doctor. Finally, um, I do that. But finally, I come to the point, and we see this next slide, and this next slide is I go to my eye doctor. Many of you have gone to the eye doctor, and this slide comes up, and they begin to say, please read the bottom, the, the, the smallest line that you can read. 
So you begin to read it, and with the help of the glasses, it says F-E-L-O-P-Z-D on number seven, and they say, well, read the next one if you can, and you begin to guess at it and do whatever. But finally, in the process of this, they, they put this little machine over your eyes, and they begin to ask you, which is clearer, one or two? or three or four, or one or four, or two or three. I mean, by the time you're done, it's like, well, was that one or was that three? I don't, I don't know for sure. But in the process of that, you do that, you get your eyes done, I wear contacts, so they prescribe contacts if, if they're different than what they need to be, whatever, and in the process of that, they help you to see. Now, I say all of that because, whoa, because the first verse in our passage today is the word see, if you look at verse 10. Jesus is saying, and he says to us, see that you, and I'll just stop there, but he says, see that you, and I want you to understand the word see clearly, because it's not the word glance. It's not something that says glance around and, and see what's going on. It's not that, that word. It is really a word that is said, I want you to see clearly. I want you to see crystal clearly. I want you to see with clarity. Jesus is really saying to his followers, this is a very important point. I want you to see it. Not only does it mean that he wants us to see it clearly, but he says, this word says, I'm pointing to this one thing that I want you to see. He says, don't glance all over the place. I want you to see this one thing. So with that, he then goes on and says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. And he begins to say that word you is really a generic type you. With all of us in this room, he would say, I want, I want you to see all of you. See, see you. And he's just saying, I, I want you to understand that this is for you. I want you to see clearly. I want you to make sure that you're looking exactly where I want you to look at this point. And then he says, I want you to see two things. Number one, he says, see that you see these little ones. And I skip some words. I'll come back to that. But I want you to see these little ones. This is, a, is a, an amazing little phrase here because the word you is really more generic about all of his followers. But then he begins to use a term of endearment. He's not talking about all the little ones. Matt talked about this, I think, a few weeks ago. But he is now talking about a term of endearment. He says, I want you, all my followers, to see those that I care for. Now it's the same group of people, same followers, same disciples, but he goes from a generic term, he goes to a very endearing term. The little ones. It's an amazing little little phrase there, but I want you to see that. A while back, I have two kids and they're both in their 40s now, which that can't be, but it is. Um, and we went someplace, and there were some of my buddies that were there, and they hadn't met my two children. And I said, these are my little ones. I'd been studying this passage, and I'm sure my kids were like, what is this, Dad? Because one of my little ones is 6'6", six, six, and played basketball at CSU. I mean. He's not my little one. But affectionately, he is my little one. But he says, but Jesus is saying, I want you to see my little ones, but I want you to see the phrase that I mixed, left out. He says, see that you, generically, do not despise one of these 
affectionate ones. Do not despise. And this word despise is really, don't look down upon these little ones. Don't think that you're better than some of the others of the followers. Don't do that. And I think it's very interesting because in the very first verse of this chapter, It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Can you just imagine that? The disciples are now coming to Jesus, and they want to know who's better than the other ones, in a sense. Who's greatest? If you go back to Mark, and, and it'll come up, I think, on the slide here. But in Mark, chapter 9, verse 33, he says, this is the same parallel passage. It says, and they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Jesus asked them. Catch this question. What were, you dis- or what were you discussing on the way? Just imagine the disciples at this point. They were discussing who is better than the other ones. And now they're caught. Jesus has heard them. And he says to them, what were you discussing? And even Peter doesn't say a word. Verse 34 says, but they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Folks, this is a problem. And Jesus is taking time here in Matthew just to share it with his followers, the youths and then the little ones. He's saying, don't despise my little ones. Don't despise other believers. Don't despise other followers of of Christ. Don't think of yourself as better than others. He is really saying to his followers, don't do this. Folks, for the last 26 years, and I love the local church. I served the local church as pastor for 20 years. The last 26 years, I've served what is called the Colorado Baptist General Convention, which we have 350-some churches. I travel to those churches. I spent 36,000 miles a year driving to them. But the issue is churches do struggle from time to time because some think followers of Christ think they're more important than others. I have served as mediator and I thought it was really interesting when Travis asked me to preach this passage I said, did they do this on purpose? But in the process I've served many churches as mediators to help them work through issues. The very first church I ever pastored, we grew by leaps and bounds, and we bought some land, and we were going to build, and one of my gentlemen that had been there from the very first day that I had stepped into the pulpit, he had voted for me to come, 
said simply these words as he stood up in one of the meetings and says, I have been here long before any of these other new people. And I will be here when all of these new people are gone. Because I'm more important. Because I've been here longer. It broke my heart as pastor. But two women who are who worked for me for years and years and years and still they did not get along and I asked them at one of their reviews, not together but separately, why is this such a problem? And they really didn't answer that question but it, each, both of them kind of said, I'm just doing to her before she can do to me. Last church I served before going to the Colorado Baptist General Convention, I had a Vietnam vet that came to the church, and in the process of that, he, he, he wasn't altogether always. Vietnam had not been good to him. And I'm preaching one Sunday, and he's sitting right over here. He's not right now, but he's sitting over here. And I asked a rhetorical question, and he stood up and started to dialogue with me in the middle of the service. The leaders of the church were like, what are we going to do with him? I just kind of put my hands out and we continued to dialogue a little bit. And then I said, we'll continue this discussion later and we went on. But the sad thing is a few weeks, three or four weeks from then, a couple of the guys came to me and said, after service and said, we need to talk to you in the office. I said, well now what did I do? But they said to me, is there any way that you think that we can keep this gentleman from coming to church? Why? Well, because we need more. Folks, it broke my heart. Jesus is saying to his followers, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. He says they're very important because they're angels in heaven. See the face of the Father. But in the process of that, he is, he is saying to us, his followers, his ones who have received his son, Jesus Christ, Jesus received Jesus. Do not despise one of the other ones. He goes from the word see and he begins to then go to the word, what do you think? And you see that in verse 12, it says, what do you think? And this phrase is really a statement that is, is, is really given with an aff affirmative answer. And the question is, if he had 90, 100 sheep and one of them goes astray, would he go look for the other one that has gone astray, and it's supposed to be an affirmative, yes, indeed, he would. But it's very interesting because this word, gone astray, is really kind of a word that means the, sh the sheep has been uh, deceived. He went away because he had been deceived. And I don't know if he was deceived because he thought the grass was greener over there than it was here. I don't know if the water was cooler over there than it was where they were at. I don't know what was going on, but he was deceived. And so he left the shepherd that was guarding him, and he went away. He strayed. He was deceived. But I love the intimate truth that is found in verse 12 because he goes on and says, what do you think if a man, a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go in search of the one that was, has gone astray? If he finds him, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the, over the 99 that never went astray. Well, this is not saying that the 99 he doesn't love. Just as uh, that one has gone astray, 
And he searches for it, and he finds it, and he brings it back. Well, so I don't know about you, but I hate to say at one point I went astray. And God searched for me. Literally every night when I put my head on the pillow during that time, God said to me, it was like he was speaking to me clearly, what are you going to do about Jesus and his cross? And I came back. I came back. That word search is an intense search. It's not that he just went around looking different places. He searched intently for the lost sheep. My wife Vicki and I got married many years ago and I gave her the diamond ring and we were going to get married by this pastor and but we, done, we were close to getting done with our counseling time, and he said to me, Doug, you do have the, the wedding band, right? And I said, of course I do. I put it in a very safe place. <laughs> and from on the way back to the house or to my room, it was like, where did I put that? So I got back into the, the room and I started searching intently. And I did find it. But it wasn't, it wasn't right away. Folks, I don't know if you may be astray You know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, but you might be astray. Jesus loves you. And he is searching for you to come back. Come back. Come back. You might be part of the 99 and you've never gone astray. Jesus loves you. Don't look down upon the other person that's gone astray. Jesus loves you. Yes, he loves the one that's gone astray and he will go search for him, but he is still right with you if you're part of the 99. You're part of his little ones. Jesus knows exactly where you're at today. One of my favorite little phrases in the Bible is way back in Genesis 3, chapter 9. <clears throat> and they've sinned and God is coming back and he says to Adam, where are you? He knew where Adam was. I mean, this wasn't, it wasn't a secret to God where Adam was. He could have gone right up to Adam. He could have. But he said to Adam, where are you? He's waiting for Adam to come back, to come to him. Here I am. And I appreciate that of God. Where are you today? Are you the one, the 99 Do you have something going on with one of your fellow little ones? 
I ask you to, to deal with it. Jesus wants you to. I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. I think every week that I'm here that man preaches, he does a simple ABC. Admit. Believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and confess your sins. If you don't know Jesus, you're not one of his little ones at this point, please just talk to somebody. Let's talk about the ABCs, about coming to know Jesus as your personal Savior. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture. I thank you for your loving kindness. thinking of us as your little ones. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters that are here. I just pray that you would just touch their heart through the Holy Spirit, that's the words that have been said in your scripture. As we give this time of public invitation, I'll be down here. We'll have others that will be here too. I'll be down there if you should want to talk to me. But Father, help us to hear your Holy Spirit and to do whatever your Holy Spirit would lead us to do. In your name I pray. Amen. Please stand.